Hello, welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time visiting. My name is Tina, your friendly neighborhood amputee, and the founder and CEO of a nonprofit called Less Leg, More Heart, named for obvious reasons. I am a medical clinician that recognized there were significant gaps in the, the care that was being provided and wanted to add layers, and so I'm doing that by the nonprofit in a few different ways, peer mentorship, and also funding for holistic approaches to care and funding for home services when people are transitioning into disability and just getting out of rehabs and hospitals home. Um, this platform serves both for cable television and also for our YouTube segments. And what I try to do is to bring people forward, goods, products forward, businesses forward that have interesting stories, inspirational stories, and education that's coming from a vetted source that has similar core values to our organization to share things that are uh, important for you to know or things that I believe are important for you to know or things that are common that you're going to come across so that you hopefully have more knowledge, more hope, uh, and more awareness moving forward to make better, more educated decisions. So without further ado, today we are going to be talking, I think, if I've got this right, about rainbow guitars? I don't know. Kyle Sykes, yes. Doctor of Physical Therapy. What is it that we're talking about today? Oh, rainbow guitars. Rainbow guitars. Yes. Okay. Love or it. Backs. So Something tell us about like your rainbow guitars. Okay. So my rainbow guitar is also named a back, and <laughs> we were just going to go over like a couple thoughts on back pain, and that's in order to kind of change how someone watching this might just think about when their back hurts, where they can go, what they can do, or maybe they've got a few avenues that they're looking at and they're hesitant because, well, when your back hurts, you kind of don't want to do things. Yeah, I mean, I've had it my whole life from when I was in gymnastics to being a young adult. And then I remember going to the doctor in the orthopedics and they had done x-rays and basically said, I mean, I was in a lot of pain. I was 18 years old. I could hardly hold something overhead. If I hinged at my hips, I would collapse from the discomfort in my lower back. I had to wake up in the morning and put my leg up on the edge of beds. Like, and I was a pretty active person. So, I mean, I was, quality of life was significantly impaired. Went to an orthopedist, they took an x-ray and basically said, it's fine, you have a couple Smurls nodes, that shouldn't cause any issues, you're good. Yeah. Dictated on the dictation machine while I was in the room so that his chart could get completed in a timely manner, and then left. And I was treated like what I was saying wasn't true, that I was either crazy or malingering, and that I just had to deal with it. Because obviously yeah. if it doesn't show up, then it's not there. Yep. And then from there, miss sort of guided myself through life going, well, I don't have a problem, so I can just beat myself up. And then it got worse and yeah. worse and worse. And other secondary things started happening. And then at some point, it gets so bad where you can't ignore it. And oftentimes, people just know to go to the orthopedist, which may yeah. not be the only and best source of well-rounded information. So I'm super excited that you're lending your knowledge about this topic today. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can have multiple sources of back pain. And your back can hurt, and it doesn't actually have to show up when someone takes a picture of it, too. And then there's also something to take into account that sometimes when you're taking a picture of it, you're in a certain position that maybe you aren't for other things. So they probably concluded, yeah, there's nothing catastrophic. You know, it's, it's not going to be a ticking time bomb. Great. But it doesn't change the fact that, yeah, well, it still hurts to move off the table right now. So what do we do about this? Right. Is, it, is it a strain? What's going on? Why am I dealing with this so long? And sure. Clinicians, people that treat lower back pain, the longer the case has kind of been in the background for the person, the more the clinician's more like, okay, there's less I can do. There get, there's, there's like this desensitization and yeah. de-escalation of concern over chronic periods of time with things that are vague like back pain, when, especially when there's a lack of objective information on imaging studies. But yeah. it doesn't tell the whole picture. And I'm excited for you to illustrate that there can be something obvious on imaging, x-ray, CT, you know, MRI, that is not the culprit and should not be treated because it's not the thing that's causing problems, but people often will target that and then don't get successful outcomes. Or something could look bad, but that bad thing that could also be appropriately treated with something invasive like a steroid injection or a surgery also isn't being, the cause of that isn't being treated. And so things are just gonna migrate and spread and move the stresses to other areas unless the reason truly is identified. So who do people go to and how do they treat this in a better way? Well, that, that's, that's kind of the thing with lower back pain is everybody treats it with the, their own kind of um, niche almost, like they have their technique, their skill. There's not a lot of interprofessional play with it, even though there'd be a really good benefit from that. Awesome. Um, people just don't play well together. Collaboration takes more time and it's not billable. Yeah, right? <laughs> So, I mean, it should be. There, there's probably a way to write some words that would allow for that, right? So let's take, for example, 
uh, gymnast back pain. So you've had back pain for, let's say, two years, you walk in and suddenly you're like, make it better. Well, if you pull up studies that look at you know, outcomes versus how long someone's had it, the outcomes don't get better as someone's had it longer, they tend to get worse. And there's a lot of factors there. Some of it's, well, how's it making you feel besides the pain? Like you're a gymnast and your back hurts. Yeah, it's, I can't do things, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. I don't, they're saying nothing's wrong with me, but I feel something's wrong with me. So yep. now I have a lack of um, value for my healthcare providers or lack of trust in my healthcare providers. I know something's wrong, so I'm gonna be sedentary or either do too much and ignore it or do too little and make some of the compensatory patterns change or the atrophies get more atrophied and the strengths get more strong and misalign it even more. Yep but it causes stress and it causes a lot of anxieties, panic even in some people with something as important. Threat. Yeah, and it's your main structural yeah. column. Like it's not a, a, a peripheral thing that you can kind of get by and you know limping through the day. It's like, yeah. it's a big deal with a lot of force on it through the day. Well, and then part of it too is it's not just like the mechanical column that we think of too. Like if you look right down the spinal column, I don't know if you can get a shot of that. I don't know if it even has that much for <laughs> patent. Um, your central nervous system's housing the thing. So it's like your brain's up here inside your noggin and then you send the tail down through here and your brain kind of thinks it's pretty important to Can itself. Can I make a quick interjection? Yeah. And I'm gonna try to get you back on track, but this is what is fun about our conversations is some of these tangents. Why don't we have a tail? Well, I mean, you do. It's right here. But why is our tail so little compared to the other animals? I think a lot of it had to do with once we started walking on two feet. All right, we had right. to change a lot about our anatomy. All right. Yeah. Time in, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Nervous system, Crap. brain on top. I was getting, yeah. Yes. So if you threaten your central nervous system, chances are it's going to freak out about that a little bit, right? So like backs, they tend to mess with us a little bit. I think part of it's because you can't look at it and see that it's okay, right? Like you ever see a little kid kind of like fall and they look at their oh, leg yeah. and if it's not cut, it doesn't hurt. Oh, yeah. But then if it's cut, it's only when they look at it. I'm the mother of a one-year-old that's yeah. literally threatening his own life most days and falls often throughout the day, and I will have to do the same thing. I visualize him while he's screaming to see if I can visualize if there's actually real damage or he was just scared. Yeah. But the only way that I know that is to be able to see it. Yes. So that's a good point. So it's kind of like the opposite of the bro body, like your beach body, bro body. Like you're in front of a mirror, what can you see? That's the muscle you work on. So it's like from here up, biceps, pecs, and then if it's not in the mirror, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's how your brain works, though. We do that habit as a society, not just because that's a quirk, but because that's like a quirk of our biology and our mm. psychology a little bit. So when you can't see it, it makes it a little bit tougher to be coordinated with it. Uh, kind of changes the way you, you think about it as it hurts, because you can't like look at it as, hurt, as, as it's hurting going, oh, it's moving just fine. Um, and then let's say you're a gymnast, you got a meet coming up, it's irritated you're gonna be defensive about it now. Now that threat's moved into affecting this aspect of your, your sport past just it being irritating during training. Okay, so you, do you get tense when you're nervous or threatened or stressed? Like do people kind of like just Just watching Game of Thrones right tight? now for yeah. the second time through, I've had like muscle contractions that make me sore the next day in my forearms. So yes, I yeah. tense up a lot. So let's think about what could irritate a gymnast back, especially one where they take a picture and they don't see too much on it. So. This is usually what people are thinking is like, oh, I've got these little rubbery things that I see on all the models of the medical offices and they always have these little scary red tags on them and that must be the thing that's going on. I got a scary red tag somewhere. I got this bleb or, you know. Um, maybe, maybe not. Hopefully that's something they could sort out there. Mm -hmm. But what happens if something in here gets irritated? You don't usually talk about these little facets, these little joints back there and you don't really talk about how, let's say a history of this or if these discs kind of get a little bit flattened over time, they're not loaded, you spend a lot of time in a desk job doing like a funky sort of rotation, you wind up with a diagnosis of a degenerative disc disease, those types of things. Well, why does it hurt? Why does it hurt, doc? It hurts when I do blah. Okay, great. So now when it hurts when you do blah, that's a mechanics issue. Okay, does it hurt when you do blah, uh, and la? Yes. <laughs> okay, all those things, fantastic. So. These are really, really sensitive joints back there. They have like a little bit of a gap in them and they're mainly there to help couple motion in your spine and block a lot of rotational motion. They're just facets and they kind of hook together. We'll reference this little guy less. Maybe I can turn and poke. Okay, so the joints, when you go into extension, mm -hmm. they close down on each other a little bit more. So they have less room to work. So what happens if I had a lot of space between those joints 
when my disc was really happy, right? Let's say it wasn't 10 years of not picking up weights, not running, jumping, skipping, all those things. And just we get a little bit closer, the joint changes over time, maybe it thickens because it carried a stress from some funky mechanic, whatever. As those things get closer and closer and closer, if I jam it and I sprain it, it's gonna hurt, right? It's just like if you bend your finger backwards, it's gonna hurt. You're not gonna be able to close your hand, your grip is gone, like that happened to me a lot when I was wrestling. You sprain your fingers, now your whole hand's useless on working with a person. The only problem is, is let's think about, okay, my back hurts, I might have sprained this doing a back handspring, right? And now it's sensitive. The muscles in the area are a little bit strained. They're spasmy. They got all that. Well, now I'm going to get concerned and I really need to be good about my posture and my back. And I'm going to just go ahead. I'm just going to arch my back more. Okay. Mm. I'm just going to yeah, arch my back side. more. Yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. Lord dose or a, uh, it's a very stiff thing. spine. We got to, I got to break that spine and but yeah, it's like fresh out of and the box. And that's gymnasts in general. We have a really significant pelvic tilt. Right. So you just keep closing the joint, closing the joint, closing the joint, closing the joint. Mm -hmm. It's not bad to have joints closed, but let's say it just took a shock when it wasn't supposed to. Let's say one side got a little bit like sticky because it got inflamed or you have a history of funky mechanics where like we spend a lot of time with one leg bent, one leg straight because that's what we do. We live in a very asymmetrical world. Talk Something about there, it. Talk right, about it, Kyle. <laughs> right. So that habit of being freaked out about your back having conflicting things that hurt it. It hurts during different times of your day. It's not just the one. It's happening during the one that is supposed to be fun and now it's stressing you out and you're getting guarded about and it. And possibly lack of validation on imaging studies and or, you know, treatment mm -hmm. options that seem right. reasonable for you. Yep. Well, and then and then let's say you've got other stuff going on. You're you're not just worried about the gymnastics meet, you're worried about school or a boyfriend Wait, broke up you or something. Wait, you mean problems don't happen in a vacuum right. isolated? So you get a little bit more stressed, maybe you catastrophize a little bit. That's a common thing with lower back pain is like when it is something that can spasm and now you're stuck on the floor, it's easy to ca catastrophize sure. that, right? Or if you do a manual job and now you can't work, Lost, yeah, you might ages. catastrophize about that a little bit. Sure. And that enhances the pain more and maybe I'll just get a little bit more guarded. And you think you're doing good habits sometimes, maybe you're not. But guarding tends to not be good over longer terms. Like right when I tweak something, you probably want to guard it. Like you're on a field, you fell, you heard a noise, it hurts now, guard it. Great, fantastic. But if we're a year out from injury and then you're getting x-rays and all these people are saying it looks fine, all that other stuff, well, maybe the guarding now isn't good. And have we integrated that into our daily mechanics? Mm. Are we doing other things that make that worse? So like some other mechanics that would show up with a gymnast besides that anterior tilt or goes with that anterior tilt is if my pelvis is supposed to be level like a bucket like this and now it's tilted forward but I need to stay standing up, my femur kind of comes forward in the socket because if I go right to neutral, well that's where I am suddenly. But I'm just going to anteriorly tilt mm -hmm. because supposedly that's the good posture that they want to see when you stick a landing. <laughs> so if my femur is kind of here and it's kind of tilted and then suddenly it rotates inward, well that's a different mechanic than if I'm here level neutral neutral. So let's think about that. Like if you're doing gymnastics and you're doing a giant around the bar, your toes are pointed, turned together, all that other stuff. Uh, you have totally messed with your hip mechanics. And there's certain muscles that actually go between, there's one main one that goes between your spine and your femur. And- Is the psoas. It's your psoas. Woo -woo. Right. So it, there's something that kind of connects to the front part of your spine and it affects the mechanics, chances are it might be kind of important in what happens to that. A lot of people just try to stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. Some people try not to stretch it because they think it's like a bone or something or they feel it go click, click over their, their hip. Or if it's manually adjusted and you haven't ever had it done before and it's super tight, it is visceral. Yes, yeah. That's that thing deep in the belly pocket that people get into that makes you feel like you're gonna lose your yeah. lunch maybe or the other side. And then, then you're <laughs> not sure why they're working on that even though like it, you couldn't really feel it in your but back. Does your impressive. back feel better? Right. It's impressive. So your compensation strategy can like spiral out of control really fast. So now you can have a tight psoas, you can have weak hips. Besides that, well, how would weak hips affect things? Well, when my hip's supposed to be here like this, and it's supposed to be neutral, if my pelvis was nice and level and fan, like I got a big fanny muscle that runs down to here. And I say fan like fan, not like fan. <laughs> so if suddenly I'm in this compromised position like Wait, this. Wait, is that why they call it fanny? I have no idea. I don't, uh, I don't think so. Wow. Can you put a light bulb above my head in the video? Yeah, I think 
I'd be that curious. might be why it's called Fanny. Let's. I would it. be curious if the etymology was. <laughs> if someone that. knows, please yeah. comment for us. So now you're probably not going to be able to use this part of the muscle the same way you could use this, or maybe this muscle is now in a lengthened position, and now you're dominant over here, or because you turned it in, you're going to go towards this one that runs to your IT band, where a lot of people lower back pain complain about. Oh, my IT bands are always so tight. The other thing about is um, I've noticed personally back pain that um, I also have a lot of tightness in my hamstrings. Yeah. So I, whenever I have like a really significant posterior chain workout, my back pain gets worsened. Yeah. So and it's oftentimes because I'm not mobilized or doing the necessary you know stretches and, su and such. But in, the same is true right for that backside because that's yeah. when I feel it a lot. And that's the other way though, that's... It's funky with hamstrings sometimes. Like it, it can be like a couple issues there. Like I've seen some stuff where like you can do some, some demos when it comes to basically good mechanics. Your body wants to move a certain way. It's grown into a certain shape that has a certain form, certain function. And when you change like an early position, it's gonna change something downstream mm -hmm. in the movement. So that big anterior tilt, if you have a big anterior tilt, your back super arched, and then you try to bend over and touch your toes, it's really hard to get there even if you let your back go then. Mm -hmm. If you start neutral, things are gliding better, and then you try to reach and touch your toes, the hamstrings just don't seem to tighten up as quickly. Mm. Um, some of it comes down to just what's your hamstring thinking? Your hamstring is probably thinking, oh, if I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a big stride and I'm going to get lengthened now where... Remember, your, your leg's not straight up and down like we're trying to think like it is. Your hamstring knows your leg's like this because it's in the game. So it's running from back here on your pelvis all the way to your femur. So as it runs that path down the back of your leg, it knows it's longer than it's supposed to be than if it started here. Mm. So let's say we got some feedback me mechanisms built in, like I don't want to strain on this stride or on this jump. So maybe we upregulate a spindle fiber and we just make that muscle feel a little bit tighter. Mm. Um, funky things like that can play a big role mm -hmm. or maybe it came from the garden. But either way, it doesn't always have to come from something red that's painted on your spine. Uh, it can just come from the mechanics. The mechanics can also make red things painted on your spine and then that's where people get confused. It's what are the red things? And let, maybe let's go through it so we know what the model is, but do you want to just give a quick two-cent tour of this for folks? The two-cent tour is cervical, thoracic, lumbar. And then we got our sacrum down here. So if you want to think about your spine, about how it's supposed to move, it's supposed to be mobile, immobile, uh, mobile-ish, and then relatively immobile. So that alternating pattern of things that can move a lot to things that move less to things that move a bit more again, it kind of repeats up and down through kinetic chains. Mm -hmm. So pretend there's a rib cage around this. Once there's a rib cage there, you go, oh, that's why that doesn't move. Well, it's not completely immobile. It's supposed to move a little bit. Even this model with like the spine, like the steel rod in it, right. it still moves. Yeah. What happens if that thing's supposed to move a little bit and then doesn't move at all? Mm -hmm. Something else is going to make up for it. Yeah. And if it's a sport-like activity like gymnastics, you're probably going to make up for it down here, not up there. Classic thing that we saw when I worked in uh, the hospitalist um, department at the hospital and, and the rehab department, we had a lot of older folks that were coming in that had osteoporosis and had degenerative discs and yeah. would have collapsed vertebral spaces yeah. that would cause significant pain, so they would get a kyphoplasty. So yeah. they would get a bunch of gook, uh, sorry for the orthopedists that are watching this, Very <laughs> stuff that I'm not sure of that's good for inside, like concrete kind of, but not really, in the actual joint space to make up for that so it's not bone on bone. But then what we would see is they would come back after minimal trauma, something that's even just a cough, and they would start fracturing or, or uh, wrecking the disc space above it and it would just move and move and move and they would need kypho, 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 kypho yeah. until they needed a rod. And it's to your point that like, because the problem necessarily isn't fixed, the stresses are just dissipated in a different direction based on the strength of the structures that are adjacent. Yeah, well you have to move around in your day to day and chances are you have to move whatever, whatever way it gets the job done. So if I came in, no, if you came in to see me yeah. in the ER and you had back pain yeah. and uh, you were admitted to the hospital because you had intractable back pain, we found not a lot on imaging, I would treat you with, as a Western medicine clinician, anti-inflammatories, rotated with Tylenol for base pain. I'd give you antispasmodics to help with the secondary spasms that are happening around the areas of issue. Yeah. I would set you up with PT at discharge. That's it. Yeah. That would be my first line therapy for you. I wouldn't know or prescribe anything about supplements or chiropractic or, and, and even know what the PT protocols are necessarily. And I don't even, and maybe you can speak to this too, the protocols that are in place, and I can speak to my condition and my legs, which we both know are very under, 
developed, uh, non-existent, <laughs> yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and some of the protocols that are in place that are being executed by PTAs in clinics because they're you know running multiple people through at the same time, and the lack of you know customization and and not to speak badly about the profession because I know a lot of wonderful physical therapists, but in general it kind of feels like. Uh, like factory, like it's just pumping out these like standard cookie cutter kinds of protocols. And I have not personally had a ton of success with things related to like back pain. And yeah. I and also some of the things that you've mentioned in our personal sessions have never even been discussed or addressed. And yeah. so I wonder if you can speak to number one, what complementary forms of treatment in someone with either acute or chronic lower back pain should people consider, because people have to be their own advocates. Western clinicians cannot prescribe things that are not FDA approved yeah. and that don't have the backing of the FDA essentially. So um, these other things are sometimes self-pay and sometimes minimally funded by insurance. But number one, what can people advocate for themselves for treatment if they should have acute or chronic lower back pain that they otherwise wouldn't get with the white coat that they see at the re regular doctor's office? And then number two, what is it about these protocols that could be improved by that young mind that's looking to be formed out there that's either pursuing PT school or just graduated and is eager to truly help in a greater way than some of the processes that are out there. Yeah. Um, so I guess what's interesting about kind of the way that you paint the scenario is like if, if you have an acute back injury, you have an acute back injury, right? And you just rule out all like the really bad sure. things that it could possibly Product be, right? is not there, yeah, yeah. So, okay, this is not a, this is not your good day. Chances are you take this, you do that, you start to feel better. Problem is we're all people. And once we start to feel better, we go, oh, what I'm doing is working. And we kind of pick what's going to give me the best bang for the buck. Um, most people aren't going to be inclined to go to a chiropractor office, then a PT office, and then go and work out later. Like that's, that's tough for people to do to fit in their day. Um, that is like a combo that you could do that would work really well though if you had back pain that's not just been acutely treated like if you've dealt with kind of a wonky back like you've worked uh masonry your whole life you throw it out every two weeks you pound whatever you need to to get back to work that's not a good cycle to be in it's it's kind of a bummer and people know it but sometimes when they go to do something to start improving the mechanics they might have like a little bit of regression. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big deterrent for them. Uh, maybe they're more active than this person over here is used to treating, or maybe they're less active than this person's used to treating. So having like a good relationship with either a chiropractor, a PT, a manual therapist, massage therapist, AT, anything like that, that's good because they're gonna kind of know what your activity level is and your tolerance is because mm -hmm. under Underdosing a lot of therapy is a big, big problem when it comes to stuff, especially stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Like if I if I got a, a mason that needs to move 200 pound stones, but I have him doing straight legged deadlifts with a 45 pound bar all the time, for some reason, I don't know how that's supposed to help in this day to day. Especially when you're in a controlled setting, you're not stressed, you're not dehydrated, you're not tired, you're not worried about the customer. And, and we're not loading you up way past what you would ever have to do at work. Well, okay, you can see how that doesn't have a very good like ecological validity yeah. in the situation. Um, so if you were dealing with, I guess, acute stuff versus chronic, or let's say, let's say acute on chronic. Let's yeah. just say you're somebody that just, your, your back flares constantly. Which is a lot of people. Yeah, first thing is don't freak out about it too much. Like there's a good skit in Louie where he tweaks his back and he goes to the doctor and the doctor is just like, oh, just be happy at any time. Your back doesn't hurt. It's doomed to hurt. And that's kind of like a really like negative way of, of painting how backs are supposed to be because this is actually a pretty cool structure. It's supposed to be flexible. Uh, the doctor in that show, he's like, oh yeah, you know, it's not done evolving and all that other stuff. And it's like, you don't want to have this thing in your back. Like this would be terrible. Walking with this is terrible. Just bending over to pick up something with this is terrible. This is made to be very flexible, but also very strong. The only problem is in order to keep it strong, it needs to be very well coordinated. And that's where things start to get messed up. Gymnasts, very, very aware of their body, but even still, they're gonna have compensated mechanics for gymnastics because that's what they're training for. They're not training to make a happy, happy spine. So what you wanna do is you wanna find somebody that likes backs and also treats backs. If you have someone that hates backs and treats backs, 
I, I feel like that's a funky combo to have. Um, sure, I'm, I bet it works for some people, but... Someone if, passionate about it. And, and something that's going to kind of build your confidence up with it, too. That way you don't perceive it as much of a threat. You're not guarding. You're not arching. You're not moving deeper into compromise mechanics unknowingly. You're not getting confused. You're not conflicting your own kind of control over the situation. Because the more you start to do something where, hey, this helped me yesterday, now it hurts. Uh, or they're telling me if I do this type of weightlifting right. with this over here, it feels better. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's tough. Um, so speaking to that. Yeah. Three things that I could do if I was a viewer that has a healthy spine to maintain or preserve spinal health. Active lifestyle. Don't freak out if your back gets a little bit sore okay. and start like twisting and pulling and doing all the stuff to it. Like that, that's a big thing is like people kind of play with their back a lot and you know, do you know if you're doing anything good for it? It might feel good that one second you go to move it, but is that good for your back? And then three would be, if you sit in a desk all day, start looking at the ergonomics a little bit on it. Mm, that's, uh, a that's a good one. Yeah, I would, I would change it up because most people that would be watching this are probably sitting down. Yeah, and, and probably, at, you know, the, the cheap, you know, desk, a lot of people did desk offices and remote work for the last year and a half. So I bet there's a lot more folks right now with back pain because their monitors aren't big enough, their seats aren't the same height that they're supposed to be for the, yeah, totally. Yeah. And there are ergonomic assessments that you can actually look up online. Oh, yeah. There are different heights and things like that. That's a good point. So Stuff then, all over the place that oh, you can look yeah. into for resources. So then three things that for people that do have back pain, is the list the same for people to improve their spinal health in the setting yeah. of already having pathology or is it a different list? Likely, what I say, uh, be active, be active, don't freak, don't out, freak about out, it. and yeah. ergonomics. And then ergonomics. I would still do those same things. It's just you, you have a little bit further to go, and you also want to take into account that just because you have back pain, it doesn't mean that you're always doomed to have back pain. It just means that maybe you're on a shorter leash. Like, let's say someone's got a ton of cartilage, biggest, plumpest discs in the world. They're bulletproof all the way around. Well, we're not that. We're going to move in a way where if I move too hard, I get too far over my skis, I might tweak something. And so also be more cautious if you're dealing with the pain. Like you don't want to freak out, but also just don't as you start to risks. feel better, people try to run immediately. And it's like, oh, you know, like you can't go from deadlifting 45 pounds to 550 overnight and then think you're not going to have a problem. Um, it's a good point. But I would, I would do the same things. Just find something that can kind of help you stay on the right side of that line and not allow things to flare or get worse. Love that. Yeah. Kyle, I am so excited about your information. I, uh, I encourage other folks to look into um, resources for back pain to, uh, if you have it. You don't have to deal with it forever and there is hope that it can get better. There are a lot of supplements out there that may or may not benefit. It's mixed literature. Look up glucosamine, chondroitin, fish oil. There's um, a number of other things. Do you have other, other I mean, amino acids and, I mean, anti-inflammatories, antioxidants. There's some oh, CBD. I'm, I'm just big on biomechanics. Yeah, and yeah. CBD. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of supplements that can also help in some of those inflammatory states, but also from the biomechanical standpoint, which Kyle is an expert in and has personally helped me and a number of other people, just if you feel like you have reasons to not move regularly or if you're suffering musculoskeletal discomfort because of the way that you're moving, find someone versed and passionate about the body to be able to help you understand, number one, what's happening, and then number two, understand your options. And finally, number three, figure out how you can move better to prevent the maladaptations and to promote a more sensible state of movement so that you can start actually fixing the root causes for the pains and the pathology that's occurring rather than just having diagnostic imaging done and then people injecting you or offering you surgeries because there are way more options out there and that is really the bottom line of what we wanted to get to you today. So Kyle, thank you so much for lending Thanks your brain. If you guys wanted more information and you are interested in um, learning more from um, Kyle, our resident doctor of physical therapy, please um, just reach out to us uh, via our website. Of course, the, disc the disclaimer that we posted at the beginning also is true. These are our personal you know, anecdotal pieces of information and some of the things that we've read and studied and that's worked for us or our cohorts, but of course does not constitute as medical knowledge or medical advice and would definitely have you look into your own uh, physician statements about what's best for you. So until next time, guys, put your best foot forward.